Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to Keep Middlesex Moving webinar series. I am Christina Fowler, your host, and today our guests are Laura Torchio of Projects for Public Spaces and Pamela Stefanik of New Brunswick City Market. They will both be giving presentations on adapting community landscapes, a place where people can connect. For those of you not familiar with KMM, we are the Transportation Management Association for Middlesex County. We work with employers, local and state government agencies to promote programs aimed at traffic mitigation, sustainability and economic development. To learn more about us, please visit KMM.org or shoot me an email. Before we begin today's webinar, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping details. The agenda will be a presentation um, beginning with Laura, then followed by Pamela, and then we will have questions and answers. To ask a question, please use the Q&A feature on your screens. You should find it at the bottom. Uh, once the presentations are complete, I will share the questions. And this webinar is being recorded and can be sent to you along with the presentation at your request. So let's begin. Our first presentation is from Laura. Laura brings more than 30 years of experience from the public, private, advocacy, health, and tourism sectors. She is a seasoned facilitator with a forte to inspire thoughtful, creative civic engagement. In her role at Project for Public Spaces, she manages and advises training, projects, and program development related to transportation, health, and community engagement. Laura, take it away. Thanks, Christina, and hello, everybody. It's really nice to be here. I have to say, this is the first time since March I've put on mascara and lipstick, so <laughs> I'm still not wearing shoes. But anyway, my name is Laura Torchio. I'm the Director of Education at Project for Public Spaces, and I've been here for about four years. Um, formerly, I worked as the Deputy Director of Transportation with um, my colleague Gary Toth, which many of you know from his time at um, New Jersey Department of Transportation, a real legend. Um, Project for Public Spaces is a planning and design nonprofit that helps people strengthen their communities through public space. And when Christina asked me to talk about placemaking and how public space, especially streets, is essential to reopening during the pandemic, I quickly said yes. We use a placemaking approach to our work. <clears throat> placemaking is not just Adirondack chairs and umbrellas or plopping down public art. Um, placemaking is a collaborative process of people coming together to reimagine and create public spaces. And this results in vibrant public spaces that contribute to people's health, happiness, safety, and well-being. I like to think of it two words, space and place. And a space is the description of land, building, or a street, where place is something that we've attached meaning to. So the engagement, the, the experience, the making creates that connection or meaning to a place. The process derived <clears throat> the process of placemaking uh, derived from observations of great people like um, Jane Jacobs and William Holly White. And P uh, Project for Public Spaces was founded on many of those observations. In Holly White's book, for example, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces, he famously said, it's hard to create a space that will not attract people. What's remarkable is how often this has been accomplished. Now this is an award-winning design in Toronto um, that clearly does not attract a lot of people. Um, and it would be great if it was a single parent who had one child and they could come push their one kid on the one swing of that swing set. But what happened on this day when the picture was taken, a family of four came where two caretakers and two children had to separate themselves because there was only one swing per swing set. So that's design, um, but this one shows a much more flexible space. It has less design and more programming that reflects the season and the community. It's much more vibrant. Um, it costs much less to put together and it attracts people. We call this the iterative approach and we're gonna talk more about that in a little while. So back to Holly White. Through his observations, he also observed that seating was one of the basic building blocks of any great public space. He mused, people tend to sit where there are places to sit. People will sit together and they'll sit apart and they'll sit while they play and they'll sit with their feet up. And if they have a choice, instead of sitting on a hard bench or a hard chair, they'll sit on a beanbag. 
people are resilient. Even when the architecture is hostile for sitting, we'll find a way to sit. We'll sit just about anywhere, as long as there's something to sit on. We'll even sit on our children if we have to. Sometimes our seats are too low, and sometimes our seats are too high. But what else do we know about what attracts people to places? So in his book, in Holly White's book, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces, he said, social public spaces are built on a set of basics. And they included, of course, places to sit. They included water, um, food, places to people watch, sun and shade, et cetera, et cetera. And we have found at Project for Public Spaces that these basics can be categorized into four key attributes of what makes a great place. And they are many uses and activities, um, a place that's comfortable and reflects the image or the culture of your community. Um, a great place has, has access, is accessible and, and is linked to other great places nearby. And I think above all, um, great places give us the opportunity to be social with one another. And these basics don't change even during a pandemic or whether we're talking about a park, a plaza, or a street. We just need to meet our basic needs like these at a distance. Um, another thing that we found is that there is a place for expertise. Um, planners, engineers, designers, there is a place for expertise, but it comes after we listen to the community because the community are the people who really know what their issues are and they can tell you what kind of solutions they've been thinking of. So that's how we operate, um, is to, to listen mostly to experiences first. And I just want to take a second to talk about that um, and the fact that everyone experiences space differently. In this picture, we have a family and some friends. They're very content. They're enjoying people watching and having some ice cream on a warm day. However, one person in this picture is not as content as he does not have ice cream like the others do. And I mention this because when we talk about public space and streets and adapting that space to flexibly serve our needs, we need to remember that everyone experiences space differently. A space that's comfortable, accessible, and social to you may feel quite different to your neighbor. We have to remember to think about age, culture, language, abilities, perceptions, et cetera, et cetera. So what is a public space? Well, Public spaces are squares, parks, downtowns, streets, alleys, transit stations, public buildings, rural communities, waterfronts, public markets, trails, parking lots, community gardens, campuses, and more. Does Middlesex County have any of these things? And placemaking applies to more than just parks and plazas. What if we treat our streets as places? Streets comprise up to 80% of a community's public space. What if we intentionally balance both mobile and stationary uses in our streets? We know when you design for cars and traffic, you get what? Cars and traffic. But when you design for people and places, you get people and places. So now let's talk about streets and how placemaking applies to them. Think of street capacity as a science class beaker. What do we want to fill it with? Do we want to fill it with the movement and storage of cars? Or do we want to apply placemaking attributes to this critical public space as well? Our topic today is adapting community landscapes, a place where people connect. It is that flexibility and adaptation that are key to resilience in a community. And this, right now, is the moment to turn up the placemaking. So how do we do that? We take an iterative approach. We try things with the community and see how it goes. I like to joke and call it test before you invest. In this image, this is an iterative approach or a spectrum of change for a protected bike lane. We don't have to do the permanent installation and spend that money right up front. We can start with a weekend or a month or a day of demonstration programs where we try it out. We lay it out with our first um, iteration and then we tweak it as we go along and we have people out there and information to help people understand how to use this facility and how to maneuver around it if you're not on a bike and you are in a car or on foot. And then later, if you really want to continue, you can go into a, a quick build that still does not cost quite as much as a permanent installation. Here's an example of 
that process in action. So this is Broadway, New York City. 2009 started with a demonstration project. Some cones and some cheap chair furniture that they put away at night and locked up. 2011, they moved into an interim design where the, the, the infrastructure didn't change. You just added paint and instead of cones, they put in temporary planters. And by 2014, they added curbing, raised the plaza and permanently opened the plaza to pedestrians. There's lots of de different ways to do demonstration projects. Here's just a couple of pictures. You know, you could try a bus only lane on your street. You could try converting some of your parking spaces into other uses. Um, you can do a protected bike lane. <clears throat> Here's an example a few years back from Minneapolis where they held an open streets event. And during the open streets event, you know, it's open to all kinds of activities, but closed to cars. And since there weren't people driving there, they could rearrange or rebalance the street to show how a protected bike lane, bike lane might work for that day. Here's another example. This is the Lincoln Hub neighborhood in Chicago. The community wanted to calm traffic and make it more friendly for pedestrians, but they didn't have the money to spend on a big capital project. So they used paint and temporary bollards and temporary planters to rebalance the street um, and create a low cost, high impact solution to the traffic calming issues they had in their neighborhood. This one is an image from Brooklyn. It's part of New York City's street seats program where businesses could apply for a permit um, and they had guidelines of how to develop their parklets. So they did that. This is one of my um, favorite Thing. This is one of my early inspirations to get into placemaking myself was the city repair project in Portland, Oregon, where neighbors come together, they get a permit to, like a block party permit to close the street and they paint a mural on the intersection and then they become stewards of that space. And placemaking doesn't only have to be in cities. <clears throat> it can be in suburbs and it can be in rural communities. This project was in Hallam, Nebraska, population 218. Um, and they felt like they were in the shadow of Lincoln, Nebraska, and they wanted to kind of create a brand or a name for themselves. So they called themselves the little town with a big heart. They got together at the intersection in town that had a couple businesses. It had a post office, it had, you know, um, a little convenience store. Um, and they said, let's figure out what we want to do here to get people to come and have this be a hub. They made a drawing and the next day they went out and they painted the hearts on the street. So that was kind of cool. Civic spaces are an extension of the community. When they work well, they serve as a stage for our, our public lives. Public spaces are the foundation of every community's health, resilience, and prosperity, and we all have a role to play in their creation and care. So let's talk about the critical role of public space and some issues we're facing right here, right now in 2020. First, um, Public spaces and streets as places provide opportunities for new and current businesses to up their corporate social responsibility gains. So CSR programs are increasingly recognizing the value in, of investing in public spaces where they have headquarters, offices, production, and distribution facilities, and even events. So can you think of any corporations in your downtowns that might be potential CSR partners that are starting to open up again, that might be invested in public space? Now is the time to reach out to them. Democracy, equity, and allyship. So democracy happens in public space. From the Boston Tea Party in the 1700s, to the Vietnam War in the 60s, to women's rights, to COVID rights, to Black Lives Matter, protesting in public space is democracy in action. It's right here and right now. People are taking to public spaces to protest the systemic racism in our country. Beyond equity and inclusion, which are words we hear a lot nowadays, no conversation about improving public space should happen without recognizing and fighting for racial injustices. Not doing so is to be tone deaf. And finally, as we begin to open up again during this pandemic, we must balance recovery and caution. And outdoor public spaces, especially streets, will be a central part of the path forward. Since March, many, many cities closed their streets to cars and opened them to people on foot and on bike. And some, like Seattle, are making some open streets permanent. 
an open air street market in Myanmar painted physical distancing booths to prevent crowding in their open market. And in my hometown in Montclair, New Jersey, the Montclair Center Bid Business Improvement District and community partners, including Bike and Walk Montclair, I'm on their board, uh, Montclair Design Shed and Arterial Streets recently achieved a recurring open street in Montclair Center. During the Reimagine Montclair ideation phase, community members brainstormed big ideas for reopening that was both festive and functional. Once open, people flocked there. And as our Governor Murphy refers to them, these knuckleheads were so excited to be out of quarantine, they forgot to practice social distancing. However, we used the opportunity to gain community feedback and we readjusted this is an iterative approach, and we went back out with better distancing protocols in place, and from now through October, every Saturday, Church Street in Montclair is transformed into a multi-use plaza. So that's it for me. Um, I thank you for having me. My contact information is on the slide, and I look forward to hearing more from Pam and the George Street Closers for New Brunswick City Market, and all the great informative webinars hosted by Keep Middlesex Moving. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Um, now we're going to hear from Pam, who has put into practice many of your ideas. Uh, Pam Stefanik has been working as the Executive Director for New Brunswick City Market for close to 14 years. Uh, City Market is a nonprofit organization that oversees the Special Improvement District in the Hub City. Uh, Pam offers specialized services for business owners, facade and awning improvements, grants, cleaning service, marketing promotions, and special events to attract visitors to the great town of New Brunswick. Okay, thank you. Pam, it's all you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Laura. That was a great presentation. Um, yes, I've been with New Brunswick City Market, which is the name of our organization. Our brand, however, is New Brunswick City Center. So that's how we promote the downtown business district. And I've been here for about 14 years. And I can tell you that this is probably the toughest time um, in my experience uh, with regards to uh, working with the businesses, open spaces for them to uh, occupy in order to move forward. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you first a video that we just recently produced in order to promote our outdoor dining. I hope you're going to be able to hear it. We can't see the video. The video is not showing up. Do you want me to try showing it from my end? Okay. Christine alerts me that the video did not show up on the screen. So she's going to try to show hers. Can, can you see it? Pam, from your end? Yes. Okay, you may not be able to hear it, but you'd be able, you should be able to see it.
Thank you, Christine. Oh, that was such a great video. I miss New Brunswick. You don't get the effects, you don't get the effects unless you really hear it too. Um, uh, it just has music. It's not a, um, uh, a vo there's no voiceover on that. But how did we get there? So initially what we needed to do was create a reopening task force. And we led that initiative and it consisted of city departments, uh, zoning, business administrator, police, city clerk, along with the parking authority, members of our organization's board and restaurant tours, not only um, the restaurants within the business improvement district, but also outside the district, because we were working with the city to try to reopen New Brunswick uh, for the entire municipality. Um, the key actions that we needed to take was to you know make sure that um, we maintained aggressive timelines and that was vital um, in all aspects of reopening we needed to facilitate ongoing conversation to assess business needs create new and temporary sidewalk cafe applications which would waive fees and expedite the process along with um, simplifying uh, the the drawings and some other aspects that each business was required to participate in in, um, in supplying the application to the zoning department. We met with the police department trying to understand their expectations uh, when we did decide to close the road, what that would look like, what the safety procedures would be. We would need to determine barriers for the street closures and how to identify and dra uh, create parklets uh safely how would we do that who would purchase the barriers how would they be set up removed and stored because initially we were told by the city this would have to be a daily aspect depending upon when we would decide to actually close the road what roads would be closed and then what parklet options did we have um, along with uh, loading zones. We also um, collaborated with the parklets, uh, the initiative for the parklets with the parking authority because we needed their permission because these were on street parking meters we would be taking up as well as the loading zones for deliveries. We also uh, involved and communicated heavily with retails, uh, business, the shops, the owners, and what their needs would be as well, maybe incorporating that somehow when we were able to reopen. We did par uh, partner with the parking authority. And with that partnership, we were able to create for the businesses that were currently just doing takeout and curbside pickup. A 15 minute grace period on street for all meters. 30 minute grace period in the lower church garage, which is the closest garage in the downtown business district area. Um, sorry. Can you see the actions page? Um, we also partnered with the parking authority on the two hour validation program, where if you come into the downtown your um, server can provide you with a two hour parking validation. So essentially- Excuse me, Pam. Yeah. The presentation is no longer up on the screen. Do you want me to push it from my end? Okay. I'll push it from my end and just let me know where to, here we go. Okay. Can you see that on your end? Yeah, push it to the uh, top. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, we also worked with the parking authority with regards to um, enabling the small business retailers and allowing them to have free parking for their employees for a period of time. That really helped lift a big load off um, uh, the businesses and the employees for parking. And then we needed to 
create a media plan and uh, develop a new landing page on our website for businesses that were open and reallocate funds. And what we did was re we reallocated some of the special service um, areas that we would generally fund, such as grant and awning uh, enhancement programs. And we created a recovery and uh, relaunch reimbursement grant uh, program, which we started with $30,000 in that the uh, small business could apply for. We also created a relaunch New Brunswick budget. Okay, Chris, go to the next slide. <laughs> Thanks. Our businesses in the Special Improvement District are mainly 95% independently owned or mom and pop shops. We have about 85% food related establishments, 8% are service industry, 4% are offices, 2% are retail based, and 1% is corporate. The executive summary uh, for the proposal that we were making uh, to the city was that the post pandemic relaunch of New Brunswick City Center uh, represents a division in the history of the city. Traditionally, magnet attractions included the theater district, Rutgers University, corporate hotels, J and J, our local hospitals, and our court system. Um, which at this time would essentially be dormant um, until the unforeseen future. And this was for the first time, the restaurants and the retailers would now become the most prominent attractant um, and basically stand on their own as a destination. So we've always provided um, funding for promotion of New Brunswick as a destination because of all the arts, culture, sporting events, hotels, hospitals, um, as well as our dining and retail. But this was the first time that the small businesses would really be the main destination piece. Um, our timeline for our proposal to the city um, was in early June, and we informed them that we needed a commitment from the city to maintain an aggressive timeline. Uh, that all the businesses in the city uh, must be flexible, all the businesses and the city uh, personnel involved must be flexible. Um, and we may have to change mid course uh, based upon what we were seeing happening once we were closing the streets. We would then need to facilitate weekly, weekly conversations with businesses as um, we saw what the impact was. And our proposed start date for outdoor dining um, on the street was June 25th. So it was a little after the actual announcement of when outdoor dining could uh, first come to fruition. It took a little while for us to get that together uh, with the businesses because there were so many components that had to um, uh, come together. The proposal actually served as a consensus based post pandemic uh, New Brunswick business survival plan. And it incorporated uh, feedback from all businesses, whether they were in the downtown district or not. The initial relaunch New Brunswick, which started with George Street uh, and a partial closure of Church Street, um, as I said, was developed by the businesses and it would answer an immediate need, which could only be met by the city government and we would need a commitment from everybody. Um, we also needed the relaxation of the regulations that were in code, investment in resources, and dedication to uh, open-mindedness uh, and most so that most businesses um, uh, could help sustain themselves, other night, otherwise they would not survive. So, yeah, so the road closure initiative. Uh, we called it the relaunch New Brunswick Street Closure Initiative to the city. And what it would actually provide is immediate creation of an economic anchor for the downtown, uh, provide many of the participating restaurants with their only outdoor dining option, economic stimulus for New Brunswick Parking Authority, a destination and marketing value for all residential buildings, as well as new construction, which of course New Brunswick is always under construction, 
Um, we would also provide arts and culture connection, which would bring performance, live music, artists, and visual arts to uh, what we were planning on doing with the downtown. The um, business responsibilities that we asked the businesses to make sure that they maintained as part of this initiative, and it was the business promise to the city, was to uh, provide a distinct seating area defined by ropes, planters, barriers, or any form of decorative element so that the licensed premises uh, would be obvious. Each of the businesses would need to uh, break down their individual needs every day. Uh, installation and maintenance of all amenities within the closure zone, including uh, umbrellas, tables, chairs, garbage receptacles, and barriers uh, would be the main responsibility of each business uh, person. And all restaurants and retailers are responsible uh, for their own trash. They would have to use their own receptacles and they would have to submit a litter uh, control plan with their application. So each uh, business would have to uh, apply for a temporary COVID sidewalk cafe extension of premise license application, which incorporated um, sketches and other things such as litter removal, um, how things were gonna be broken down, things like that. Next. Actions that we needed. So for George Street, we needed to identify the closure of three blocks and um, we would need crowd control barriers at each of the intersections. We would maintain the cross streets as open. Uh, we would allow dining tables, <clears throat> excuse me, to set up midpoint. So if there were multiple food establishments that wanted to partake in this, they would only be allowed to set up tables midpoint, which would provide them with limited accessibility. However, there's some areas of George Street that would allow full width use of the roadway if there was no one across from them. Uh, so some restaurants could go and use the whole extension of George Street from their facade or from their curb line to the next curb line. On Church Street, we did a partial closure. So with that, <clears throat> we asked that we remove all on-street parking and utilize loading zones we also um, asked that restaurants be allowed to transform the parking lanes into dining areas or streeteries, as some people call them. And we would then maintain the existing sidewalks. We would also then designate curbside pickup areas for third party or people that are just still coming for takeout and to go or curbside options. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is what we proposed as far as uh, George Street was concerned. So the yellow areas are the three blocks maintaining the side street as uh, open uh, cross streets. And we would need barriers at each area. Um, so from Albany to Church, and then we did from Church to Patterson, and then from Patterson Street to Byard Street. So we would need barriers actually just on the street areas. Let me go to the next one. This gives you a little bit of an idea of when we go to take the outdoor dining onto the street, then the sidewalks can become open for pedestrian passageway. The next one. This is Church Street. So most of our side streets in New Brunswick uh, are one way and Church Street is a one way. So it would allow the on street parking meters and the loading zone on one side of the roadway to be closed to through traffic, uh, pushing the traffic over to the left-hand side, as you see here. And the building on the left kind of represents, a, a, let's say our parking deck. So on Church Street, people would still be able to drive up Church Street to either cross over and continue along Church Street or pull into the parking deck 
without any um, obstruction. And we would have the dining area on the right hand side of that roadway, again, opening up the sidewalks for pedestrian passageway. Next slide shows you just a list of some of the establishments that would be incorporated on each of those blocks. And it also incorporates at the top on the right hand side, just two of the four restaurants that are utilizing Church Street as um, an outdoor dining venue option, taking it to the street. And then next, what we did was we were connecting, before we actually opened the streets, you know, we were basically just doing takeout and um, curbside pickup. So what we were trying to do was make the streets a little bit more brighter so we connected with some um, arts organizations as well as the New Brunswick Arts Program uh, uh, school uh, students uh, from the school. And they created chalk art in front of some of the businesses. So this is just an example of true uh, barbershop. And they created a piece of art that looked similar um, and could connect to that business. The next slide is uh, in front of a, um, a ramen noodle business. So this was a piece of artwork that they created in front of the ramen noodle place. And we did this throughout the downtown, uh, probably just a few weeks into, I'm gonna say May. And um, the next uh, slide then shows, now we're out on the street and we have done several different types of street murals. Uh, there was a huge social justice mural that um, was painted at the intersection of uh, George Street and Livingston Avenue. And this one is a mural that we did live while we had the streets closed uh, so that people could watch. If they wanted to, they could partake in helping to color in uh, certain areas. The next one. This brings us to June 25, when we actually brought everything onto the street. And to the left is um, by the bus shelter. So this is a, an example of some of the marketing that we did where we were doing Dine Now in New Brunswick. Our campaign was safe, clean, convenient, and fun. And uh, this was one particular uh, venue where they actually bought their own barricades and then set up tables and umbrellas. On the right hand side is another example of an establishment uh, setting up tables. Um, again, it's the same establishment. You'll see both of these establishments here took the whole uh, roadway because there was no one across from them. Next slide. This is an example of some of the barriers that we're using. So initially when we began this, we brought the police in to talk about security. We were originally asked to obtain and place the barriers. When the police came in, they indicated that they wanted to take over the placement of the barriers because they were going to be responsible for safety, not our organization. So as you can see, the police department has indicated or placed these white these are heavy duty um, safeguards, and these are only at two locations. These are at the Baird Street closure, where it's a hard stop, and then at Albany Street and George Street, which is a hard stop. Everywhere else has the metal bicycle style, I'll say, barriers um, at each of the other intersections. And you can see here a little bit where Chai Shanaik takes up half of the street, and then Fat Cactus has opened and they're midway on their side of the street. This is a small park. This is uh, Kilmer Park. And it's, if you're familiar with New Brunswick, it's on the intersection of uh, George and Albany streets by Old Man Rafferty's and where Starbucks is. And two establishments are sharing this park for outdoor dining. It's beautiful in the evening and it has fabulous ambiance. Um, and I highly recommend coming out to, uh, to enjoy that. So we have Old Man Rafferty's on your right-hand side and then Salt uh, Restaurant is on um, the left-hand side. 
Next. This is a photo of where the harvest moon is. And it shows you in the evening um, uh, a little bit of a glance of how we're using some outdoor space and um, making it uh, much more viable for the businesses to um, drive income. We're also programming music at every location, Thursdays through Sunday. We also purchased and installed ambient lighting, the Edison lights that you see in the background and on the sides. We installed those. So in the evening, it kind of gives it a little bit more ambiance uh, to the setting. And this is a photo of uh, Tavernon George. This is another entity and how they have theirs set up. So they have their own barricades. They have their own um, uh, uh, ownership of the um, the signage that they put all around the barricades and they have their entire business area barricaded in. So you here, you can't walk in from the sidewalk. There's actually an entrance way and you have to have a mask on. Um, actually, you have to have a mask on anywhere where you walk around if you're going to be in a area where there's diners. Uh, that you're asked to walk on the sidewalk and be waited by the hostess uh, to be seated. Next. This is a, an example of salt on Church Street and how they're utilizing the um, parklet or parking spaces for their outdoor eatery. Here they have some tents up, they've put some lights outside. These are the barriers again and again. It's, it's helping them to expand their dining experience. You can see some tables up against the facade as well. Uh, but most of the diners are enjoying uh, their lunch or their dinner um, on the street. Next. And we have the Stress Factory. Um, they are outside. They installed a huge outdoor tent. So they're doing live comedy almost seven days a week. And it's very exciting to see the, um, uh, it, it's just so exciting to see the people come out. They're sold out almost every night. They've expanded. They only used to do performances Wednesday through Sunday. Now they're doing it almost seven days a week. So this has been really helpful in driving more business. On the weekends, the, st the Stress Factory has two shows. During the week, they have one show. People come in um, for a show, they will go out to other areas to have a few drinks and then they'll come to the stress factory or if they're coming to a late show at a stress factory they'll come early and have dinner at another establishment maybe uh, on george street and then come see the show so everyone is working hand in hand uh, sharing um, uh, the business opportunities here and well as well it's helping drive business into the parking decks uh, helping the parking department the parking authority thrive this past weekend, we did something called New Brunswick Relaunch. And um, our initiative is, again, we do it right, we do it safe, and we do it together. And Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we had themed evenings. So on Thursday, we had a citywide jazz night. And we had several entities just doing live jazz, as well as a brass band that walked around throughout town uh, probably from 6.30 till about 8 p.m. And then they stayed at one of the uh, restaurants and performed for the rest of the evening. On Friday, we had Jimmy and the Parrots. It, so it was a Margaritaville night. And on, uh, I'm sorry, it was Friday. On Saturday, unfortunately due to the weather, the street band did not perform on that day, but they are gonna be here as long as it doesn't rain, tomorrow, Thursday. So Thursday is their uh, rain cover day, um, but they were scheduled on Saturday. And then on Sunday, it was just really kind of like an open jam kind of session where we had all forms of music performing on Sunday and we had a caricaturist roving around. We had a, um, a tarot card reader. We had someone doing henna. We had a drum circle. 
So we were involving some of the local artists to come in and participate as well. And this is some of the activities. So we, again, we have um, caricaturists roaming around. We have a uh, beanbag or cornhole toss. Uh, that is the mayor being interviewed by News 12 um, on one of the days where we first opened. And then the next slide. This is just a picture of uh, some of the live music that we're having throughout town. Um, they're either stationed within, uh, within an area that's designated uh, for a particular restaurant or they may be on the street corner and they may be performing for two other entities. So, and then uh, we just, you know, we have seen since this started an increase of foot traffic. Um, if you want to learn more, you know, go to newbrunswick.com. I can always uh, also share the actual link to the uh, two and 10 minute video that we have. We're also working on 30 second commercials uh, because we only have a few weeks left to um, entertain outdoor dining. And uh, our next step is to start talking about what are our streets going to look like once the cooler weather comes. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Again, visit our website. Um, and I want to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pam. Uh, another great presentation. Uh, clearly, the work involved uh, is significant. And uh, by the look of the video, the pictures, what an incredible feat. Congratulations. Um, OK, let's see if we have any questions. Give me one second to oh, my video. Martin, thank you for that, pointing that out. Oh, yes. OK, you saw that. OK. Yes. Good to know. <laughs> OK, uh, any other questions? Thank you, Martin, for pointing that out. OK, um, I actually do have a question before they start rolling in. Um, what would you say is the biggest challenge and what, and this is for both of you, what would you say is the biggest challenge in uh, starting such a project and what advice do you give to a community that uh, is starting from scratch, let's say? Starting from scratch. So, you know, there are some towns that have the spaces, but they don't have, um, they don't have anyone to, or they, they, they have the spaces, but they haven't started yet as far as, as, as closing the streets down and what's involved. <laughs> Yeah, so some of the municipalities that I've actually spoken with um, have not yet closed any roads down um, or not allowing businesses to close roads down. They're utilizing the sidewalks only. Um, one of the most difficult um, components of this was just getting it started and creating the task force, getting the involvement from the city um, and the commitment from the city to move forward. Once we had that, uh, the ball rolled pretty fast and it continues to change. You know, um, they, I must say that the city is uh, very open to feedback and um, is, we are on, actually we are on our fifth executive order from the mayor. Mm -hmm. So um, there have been a lot of tweaks along the way. Yeah, I would agree get people together and, you know, have conversations about some ideas of what you want to do. Um, even if your, your town isn't on board to start with, once the stakeholders start yelling together and um, coming up with some really good ideas, then the town often gets on board when they know more people are interested in a, a good idea. Um, and then, the other thing I was going to say is start small. I mean, I loved the example of pulling some of the, art, the artists and the students in to do the chalk art. It's temporary, mm -hmm. uh, it's positive, it's engaging, um, both for people from the art end, people from the business end, and passers-by. And that can start a snowball effect, too, for these kinds of things. I would say start by talking with you know, like-minded people um, and start small. Great advice, great advice. Okay, I'm gonna give another second or so for any questions. 
Um, I also want to let everyone know that I am going, this is being recorded, so we will be sending the recording along with the copies of the presentations and uh, the video link as well uh, to anyone that has missed it or, or joined late. Um, oh, of course, let's see. Uh, what changes do you anticipate now that some limited indoor dining is available? And it's open to either one of you. Um, I've surveyed businesses, and the, it's not really going to work for the smaller businesses. They don't have the seating capacity. You know, they, <clears throat> indoor dining may only allow them two tables. Um, the larger establishments that can hold 100 people, um, it will help them. Uh, but the commitment from the businesses here in New Brunswick is to continue doing outdoor dining, whether that's sidewalk cafes as well as uh, in the street, uh, on street dining, which happens Thursday through Sunday. They still wanna continue that because that's the only way they're gonna continue to drive more revenue. I wanna, I wanna just chime in. I mean, I don't have an answer to um, changes that I anticipate or communities can anticipate, but I, can say that um, I took a trip recently that um, was, you know, not in America, it was in Europe, and there was a lot of outdoor dining. Anyway, um, this was pre-COVID. And one of the things I noticed was that they had the, the space heater set up and every chair had a blanket on it. And so even in the cooler weather, people were still enjoying outdoor, outdoor dining. Now, I don't know if that is gonna work here um, in the United States, could, might, maybe, I don't know. Um, but I just wanted to share that observation. Yes, I remember we were in Spain last November, two Novembers ago, and um, it was nice to see the blankets on the chairs. It was a nice touch and the heaters. It, and we, we spent the entire evening outdoors and it was chilly. So it can be done, you just have to mm -hmm. think outside the box. Um, okay, uh, next question, how, and this one's for Pam, how did emergency services respond to closing George Street? They were very positive. Um, we maneuvered, at, you know, that's why we had to leave the side streets open so that if in any event, emergency services needed to um, attain access, they could very easily. And we tried to make sure that whatever tables, you know, even though there were areas where we extended from curb to curb, uh, we made sure that there was easy accessibility uh, for the staff and the um, police to move whatever equipment was in those areas promptly so that um, an emergency vehicle could could come through. So they were they they came on board pretty early on in the conversation once the first executive order uh, was being drafted. Okay, we also have a question from Martin, and we've kind of already discussed this. Uh, do you have any ideas for continuing this during the cold weather? If so, what are those ideas? Um, <laughs> I want to share something else that I just thought of. Several years ago, my daughter was taking French in high school, and we decided that during President's Weekend for school, we would take a drive up to Quebec um, with her in February. During, what do they call it? They, they call it the Ice Festival or something. I forget exactly what it's called. It was so cold, but we just wore like I, I mean, there's no such thing as bad weather, they say, right? Only inappropriate. <laughs> so we wore ski boots and ski pants and parkas and, you know, face coverings. And we were walking around in 20 below degree weather. And we had a great time. And they had little spots with heaters, you know, that you could get around or fires and things like that. And then they also had these, um, it was like a like a pole that people were carrying with this little snowman on top, you know, because it was like all about this snowman ice festival thing. Well, we discovered, now this might not be appropriate, but <laughs> we discovered that the head came off and people filled the entire thing with like some uh, 
whiskey. <laughs> now that's thinking outside the box as far as keeping warm. <laughs> People live in cold climates. One of the questions talked about culture. It might be culture too. Yes, yes. I see someone in Germany, uh, I lived in Germany for six years and the weather wasn't an issue even with snow on the ground, but that may be cultural. Not sure why Americans wouldn't adapt well. But yes, we do need to give it a try. Yeah. Um, yeah. Our executive, for, for New Brunswick, our executive order for outdoor dining goes through November 20th. Oh, good. Okay. Um, our, our, our next, one of our next meetings starting next week will be how do we deal with the cooler weather? Oh, okay. I see hot spiced wine is a, is a response to how to deal with cold. <laughs> um, one question, what, uh, one of the complaints in my town is expanding outdoor seating only benefits a limited number of businesses. They feel favoritism is at play. Any advice or experience on how the seating can benefit all? Good question. Okay, so in New Brunswick, um, we, we experienced something similar. So let's say you're a small pizza parlor or um, uh, a, a smaller entity uh, that maybe does not have a large facade area. What, what the city agreed to do was that if the business decided they wanted to come out to the street and put down out, outdoor dining tables, they could ask their neighboring business. So for instance, this particular establishment has a clothing store on one side and a health food store on the other side. So as long as the business owner received approval to use the sidewalk area in front of the facade of those two um, adjacent businesses, then they would be allowed in their sketch to apply for additional tables along the sidewalk that incorporated that. So right now, with a six foot, you know, distance that only allowed them one table outside, mm -hmm. who cares? So in, by doing this, it allowed them, uh, I think, five tables. Now with that, we did find too that some of the businesses, because the sidewalks were municipal property, some of the businesses were coming back saying, why do I have to provide you with a million dollar COI to cover my tables on a municipal sidewalk? Well, it's to cover in case someone injures themselves or gets sick or, you know, um, so that was a concern uh, from some of the establishments is trying to reason with them and, and trying to get them to understand why it was their responsibility if they wanted to come out. Um, they were looking at the city to help cover additional costs because of the time. But uh, we, we, got, we have everyone to, to comply and it was open to everybody. Everyone was able to, to do this. Um, they were able to either come out onto the, onto the sidewalk and if they wanted to do so, they could extend into the street. They just had to apply for it, that's all. Good. Um, Pam, uh, Somerville, for your, for your next meeting, Somerville placed heated igloos on their pedestrian plaza during the winter. So that's another, that's another good option. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I think if, uh, last call for questions. Um, other than that, I wanna thank you both uh, for a terrific presentation and thank you for everyone on the call. Um, our small businesses are the backbone of our economy. So, um, if you have a small Main Street, if you have a, a favorite place to go, I highly recommend taking a visit, even if it's just takeout, because um, together we'll get through this um, and, and we'll adapt to whatever the next stage may be. So I'm going to close up the questions. And uh, I, like I said before, this is being recorded and I will email everyone a copy. And thank you again for being on the call and have a great rest of the evening. Thank you. Bye.